Now I'd like to introduce today's speaker. Today's featured speaker is Ada Poon. Ada Poon is an Associate Professor of Electrical Engineering and a Terman Fellow at Stanford University. Her research focuses on providing theoretical foundations and engineering platforms for realizing electronics that seamlessly integrate with the body. This is emphasized in her research group by using a vertical integration of diverse fields ranging from physics, wireless technologies, and low-power integrated circuits. She holds a PhD degree in Electrical Engineering and Computer Sciences from the University of California at Berkeley and received her Bachelor's of Engineering degree from the University of Hong Kong. She has received the Okawa Foundation Research Grant in 2010 and the NSF, and the NSF Career Award in 2013. So now I'd like to, to turn the floor over to Ada for her presentation today. Um, thanks to Stephanie and thanks uh, for everyone joining the uh, webinar. Uh, before I, I I start the presentation, I would like to just give a very brief introduction about you know my background. Um, I study, as uh, Stephanie mentioned, I study my PhD at Berkeley, and it is in the area of information theory uh, for the application you know in the wireless domain. And after graduation, I um, spent some time to at Intel to design uh, uh, radios and also we're in a startup to design high data rate radio, which is the predecessor of what we now know about, you know, L2.11 AD, which had to accomplish gigabits of data rate. After a while in industry, I decided to go back to academia and totally change my research area from um, information theory as, um, to medical systems, and especially um, what I would like to do it is I would like to see if I can build electronics in the scale of a medicine pill um, such that we will use the electrical method to electronic method to treat diseases rather than a chemical method. For example, you know, right now when we are sick, usually we will um, take a drug and eat a pill and hope that uh, we will get better. And by taking a pill, here, we are using a chemical way of modifying the biological activities. But biological activities can be modified not only by a chemical way, but also can be uh, modified by an electrical, thermal, mechanical, and the optical way. The reason why the chemical way dominates, um, if you're looking at the history of the pharmaceutical, actually 100 years ago, all the different methods, they're very, you know, it's, um, it's well used, all the different methods, not only the chemical way. The reason why chemical way dominate, it is because um, it is, we, it is uh, disposable. That means pharmaceutical companies can earn a lot of money by having patients to take the drug and then to keep buying the drug. But at the end of the day, um, not only the chemical, we can treat diseases not only through the chemical way. And in my research, I'm focused, it is on, because I'm in electrical engineering, my research is focused on using the electrical way and the optical way to uh, modulate the biological activities um, to achieve a therapeutic treatment. In particular, I'm very interested to build devices that are very, very small, like this one, that I could put close to the nerve or to the organ where the therapeutic actions take place. And I do believe that by, by putting the devices close to where the action point is, it would, be, it would have less side effects than taking drugs because drugs add more globally throughout the body. And that's the mission and the vision that I had. Uh, at the time when I returned to, to the academic. It is, I really want to build electronics or devices that are so small that it could really put close to the nerves or the organs of, for therapeutic uh, action. And in order to do that, one of the major obstacles to make these devices very small such that it can put close to the nerves or to the organ to take the action, it is the energy source. Um, when we are talking about energy source, first of all, we think about using a battery. And currently, in most of the implantable devices, um, the battery occupies more than half of the space, and it is in the scale of a centimeter. And there are newer methods like uh, piezoelectric, glucose harvesting, thermoelectric, and biopotential. 
Um, the problem with all these new methods is that the power density is far below 0.1 microwatt per millimeter square. Let's imagine that we need to consume about 10 microwatt of power in order to do something useful. Then the dimension of all these new methods, uh, the, the source dimension will be on the order of centimeter. That is, we haven't solved the problem of the bulkiness of the battery. We just moved the bulkiness of the battery to the bulkiness of the other energy harvesting devices. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, my background it is in wireless. And the reason why we can transmit data over the air it is because we're able to transmit energy over the, the uh, um, RF energy over the air. So how about we harvest the energy um, wirelessly such that we can remove the battery entirely? And, and energy harvesting using the uh, radio frequency signals is not something new. And actually, we're using this no long time ago. The devices that are on your left, it is a, um, you may wonder what it is. Uh, it is a pacemaker, the first pacemaker. And as you can see that inside the pacemaker, it is like a metal cane. Um, that's a coil, this coil, this is the coil. And then it receives energy, it is also wirelessly from a device that it is put on the chip. So the mechanism is very similar to our electric toothbrush. You could assume that the pacemaker, it is like the toothbrush, and then the devices that put on the chest, it is like the, the base station for the toothbrush to get charging. And the mechanism for both, are, I would say that it is pretty much the same. Um, and the person who implant these devices, um, it is the first people who implanted it, it is in 1958, which is more than half a century ago. Um, she, he implanted it at the age of 43. Uh, after implanting these devices for a few hours, um, he has to implant another one. And at the end, he had 26 pacemakers got implanted into his body. Uh, and he died at the age of 86, not because of uh, cardiovascular disease, but it's because of uh, skin cancer. So, 26 pacemaker, and and the and the earliest one is, is the one shown here is using uh, wireless pow powering to power up the pacemaker. And in the 1990s, uh, this is the. Uh, cooker implant, which is using similar idea, it is like the electric toothbrush to charge up the devices. So this is the external device, this is the internal device. And as you can see that, there's also a large coil that is um, on the implant, and because the coil is so large, it is just put under the skin, and then there is a neat wire here to connect to the electro, and the electro is put in inside the inner ear, for the stimulation. Now what I want to do it is I want to cut all these devices and the wire. And I just want to have that part, the electro part left. And this is my device that such that I could just implant it in the location where I want to do the stimulation. So in order to do that, the first question that I have in my mind it is why everyone else using inductive coupling to, as a mechanism to deliver power wirelessly uh, to, the, uh, to the implantable devices, which is, as I mentioned, it is the same mechanism as the electric toothbrush. So why this is the dominator uh, mechanism? Um, what if I have a freedom to choose the thoughts that I could put outside the body? Um, any, any shape doesn't need to be a circular loop as the one that we used before, um, what will be the optimum dimension, optimum shape uh, to deliver the maximum power to a small implant inside the body? So I started this problem in 2008 as a very theoretical problem. It is I don't mind and I don't care how to implement it. I just want to obtain the upper bound. Once I obtain the upper bound, then it will, the way to get the upper bound will give me intuition on how to realize the optimal source. And I have a way to justify whether the source is already good enough. 
Without the upper bound, I don't know whether the source that I'm designing it is good enough. And and the design method, the um uh, the way I formulating the problem, it is very similar to the way we solve problems in information theory. For example, in information theory, we will try to um, find out what it is the channel capacity without talking about how to implement the coding and decoding uh, algorithms in order to achieve the capacity. But I, I'm not going to go into the detail of the mathematics involved, but instead I would like to show you the, um, the results. So luckily, after solving you know, the um, Maxwell equations, we are able to obtain the solution for the optimal source and the optimal efficiency. As I mentioned, I don't want to go into the math. Um, instead, I will show you a numerical example where the, that the optimal source current density is trying to power up a device that it is put on the, uh, on the heart across a trash wall which composed of one centimeter air gap and four centimeter heterogeneous tissue, for example, skin, fat, uh, muscle, bone, rib bones, and then uh, heart muscle. Um, so the, the graph, it shows that the efficiency um, at the, about the one, about the two gigahertz range, um, the efficiency, it is two orders more than the one that we currently use that it is in this region, in the inductive coupling region. And the reason why we can accomplish such a high efficiency in the optimal source is because, let's look at the circular source that we used to use in inductive coupling, like the electric toothbrush or the early pacemaker, and also the optimal source structure, which is given in the figure here. Um, when we're looking at the loop source, the magnetic field that it is uh, from this source is divergent. As you could see from the pointing vector, the white line, it, 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 diver it diverges. But the magnetic field from the optimal source, it converges, it tries to focus to the location of the implant, and then after focusing to it, it diverges. And because of this focusing effect and also the uh, redistribution of the hotspot, which is the loss corresponding to the loss, that's the reason why we're able to get about two orders of magnitude better efficiency than the current solution, which is based on the inductive coupling. Uh, let's take a closer look on what happened from the optimal source. Um, for the optimal source, what happened it is the the electromagnetic field, the magnetic field that is outside, outside the, uh, close to the source and outside the tissue, it is evanescent in nature. That is, it is non-propagating. But when it interacts with the tissue, it becomes propagating. As you could see, the majority of the uh, wave components is within the dotted circle, which is the wave number. Within it, it means that it is propagating. Outside it, it means that it's non-propagating. Now, this is very different from inductive coupling, where the, magnet, the magnetic field outside the source is non-propagating. When it interacts with the tissue, it is also non-propagating. And that's the reason why the inductive coupling method or the near-field method, the magnetic field has limited penetration because it's non-propagating outside and it's also non-propagating inside. While the optimal source, it is not propagating outside, but it becomes propagating inside the tissue when it interacts with the tissue. And this is the fundamental difference between the optimal solution versus the one that we conventional use. And because of this property, we are able to make the devices very small and implant it pretty deep inside the body. Now, in order to so far, we talk about it's just a math mathematical solution and a mathematical result to show that um, what is the optimal way to transmit energy across a, he a set of heterogeneous uh, tissue. Um, in order to implement this source, um, we found out that you know the source when the tissue is removed, it is not propagating. When there's a piece of tissue there, the field is propagating, and this is not something common with uh, an antenna structure. Initially, we were talk, we talked to some antenna people, we tried to get help from them, but 
they have problem understanding our requirements because um, it is hard for them to decide a source that is non-propagating. As the one you see here, when there's no tissue, it is not propagating, that it is not an antenna anymore. And they are true, this is not an antenna. And because um, um, of this vessel uh, uh, property, uh, we have no choice but by the bullet ourselves. And I spent half a year is trying to learn the electromagnetic tools and every day just looking at the optimal current distribution that's shown on your left uh, for half a year and try to find a source that will mimic this uh, optimal current distribution. And luckily, we are able to find a source as seen on your right that it is composed of uh, some um, circular slot structures and some circular loop. And with this structure, uh, we, could we, we could accomplish about 10% from the optimal solution, as you can see from the, this curve on the receive power versus the source device separation. Um, in this uh, experiment, we basically, it is building the coil that is about 2 millimeter in diameter and 3 millimeter norm. And in order to measure the receive power, any wire that attached to this coil will interfere with the uh, radio frequency. That is, the measurement that we got will be inaccurate. Most of the energy will be picked up by the cable. And in order to um, solve this problem, we build a tiny circuit where it will harvest the energy from this tiny coil to millimeter coil, and then there's a circuit that will convert this energy into pulses. By the and the frequency of the pulses is proportional to the um, received energy. By adjusting the different level of the input energy uh, and attaching an optical fiber to an LED. So optical fiber will not interfere with the radio frequency transmission. Therefore, it solves the problem that we will pick the, the cable will pick up the energy instead of the coil. Um, by measuring the frequency of the light pulses, we are able to infer the receive power um, in this experiment as shown in the curve that on your right. So after we have this source, uh, we put the probe, the probe that I showed in the, in the previous slide, and into a 119-pound uh, pig and put it in the, um, in the brain and also put it in the, in the heart and also in the brain of this, uh, um, of this uh, um, uh, poultry model. And with the transmitter, which is uh, emitting about 500 milliwatt of power, so the reason why I pay 500 milliwatt of power is because this is pretty much the average output power of a cell phone. So if I use this number, it should be safe. Um, it's about, it, it is able to deliver about 200 microwatt of power into the heart and the, into the head, which is about 5 to 5.5 centimeter from the surface of the animal, from the surface of the animal. It's quite deep. And the devices that we're using is only two millimeter in diameter. And in order to put it into perspective, what 200 microwatt of power can do, our pacemaker consumes about 10 microwatt, and deep brain stimulation consumes about 100 microwatt. So with a source that output 500 milliwatt of power, which is pretty much the same output power of the cell phone, and the device that we are using is also on the dimension of the cell phone, which is 6 centimeter, which is about the uh, size of the iPhone 5, not the 6S. 6S is too large. Uh, as it's able to deliver enough power for both pacing and deep brain stimulation with this device, that it is quite tiny. Now, at this point, uh, we got a lot of criticism from people saying that, is it safe? Even though I tried to make it the couple, the transmit power to be 500 milliwatt, which is the average cell phone emitted power from the cell phone. So if you can accept cell phone is safe, then you should be able to accept that our device is safe. But since we got a lot of criticism from people, and I'm, before I joined Stanford, or before I come back to academia, I work at early stage startup. And the way we try to certify our devices is to go to a independent lab and then certify safety. So I use the same approach, I just want people to shut up. And then we send our devices to a certification lab to uh, demonstrate that uh, the device is safe. And to my surprise, 
Okay, before we got the report back, uh, I just feel that this is an academic project. Um, if it is barely meet the safety threshold, I'm pretty happy. But to our surprise, it is 10 times below the safety threshold. That is, it is really safe. And this is the setup that uh, the, the lab is doing in order to measure the safety of the devices. Basically, the device is put under leave a can of solution that limit the body, and that's a robot um, that is measuring the electric field um, in the solution point by point, and then find out what's the p uh, uh, p specific absorption rate location, and, and then do the processing and give us the report back. Uh, when I got the report and I found out that, wow, it is quite safe, I tried to understand why it is so safe. So we go back to the source that we decide. And as you can see that in our source, we fit the devices into 16 locations. There's four ports, but then it actually has 16 locations to fit the device, to, to fit the source. And the pit spot, the pit hotspot, the hotspot usually it is close to the feed line, close to the feed region. And here we distribute the feed region to 16 locations. And that's the reason why we, uh, we could our um, size it is pretty low. It is 10 times below the safety threshold. It is by accident when we decide the source, we distribute the feed regions into 16 locations. Now, at, this, at that point, we become more ambitious. We say, okay, let's increase the uh, transmit power such that we barely meet the safety threshold. In this case, we are able to deliver uh, about two milliwatt of power. Uh, at a distance of about five centimeter to a device that's only two millimeter in diameter. So two millimeter of power can do a lot of things currently. We're trying to integrate it together with the camera that it is one millimeter clip in dimension. And imagine that, you know, um, with a 256 uh, uh, by 256 pixel, uh, 14 frames per second. Uh, we don't know what it's going to be useful for, but we feel that it's pretty cool to do, you know, a tiny camera that you could look around inside your body um, to do something interesting. So after we demonstrate the safety, uh, um, we also demonstrate the real-time tracking. Now, I don't want the patient who holds the transmitter has to keep moving it in order to find the spot that will deliver energy optimally to the implant inside. This is not uh, user-friendly. I would like to accomplish this electronically. And this is very similar to um, uh, when we are taking pictures for the camera. Using the camera, we do the auto-focusing. And in these devices, we are also able to do the auto-focusing, as you could see from the uh, panel or graph that on your left, uh, up, upper left, that it shows it could, that it could focus the energy to the different steps and the different directions. And in this uh, example, we use a Stanford S to illustrate these properties. When adaptation is on, the entire Stanford S light up when the device is moving, you know, within the source region. Uh, when the adaptation is off, only those uh, points that it is near the focal point of the source lights up. And the coverage region, you know, when adaptation is on, it is about six centimeters. That is, if the patient, you know, holding the devices that it is offset by about, you know, a few centimeters, we are still able to correct it. So now we demonstrate the theory behind and then try to realize the source to accomplish the, to approach the optimal solution and then demonstrate the efficiency, uh, safeness, safety, and also real-time checking. Now thing it is we want to demonstrate that it could do something. Now we move in the LED and then we just put two electro into the same device. It becomes a pacemaker. So pacemaker is really easy to build if you want to build one. Um, in here, it shows the pacemaker that it is on a, um, put on the finger. We find a student that with the biggest finger such that it could get a pretty good contrast. But we also put it close to a catheter to illustrate that it could be delivered, you know, through a catheter using minimally evasive procedures into the, um, into the body. Um, in this case, we put the devices uh, using uh, open chest operation into a rabbit. Um, it is the first time 
I see a physical rabbit. Um, I think, you know, I didn't know that rabbit is so large. It is more like a bunny to me. And then it is very cute bunny, and we, we had to open the chest and stick it in the devices, into the applets of the, of the bunny, and then close the chest and then turn on our source. Uh, here it shows that when the device is on, when the source is on, the pacing of the rabbit it is uh, more regular and faster to illustrate the capability of accomplished cardiac pacing. So afterwards, um, being a theorist by training, as I mentioned, and my PhD is in information theory, the way we decide the source actually is quite ad hoc. Uh, I look at the source and then I will try to find a, a structure that will mimic the, the optimal source. Um, as I mentioned before, the interesting thing about the source is that when um, the wave that it is outside the tissue is non-propagating, when it interacts with the tissue, it becomes propagating. It needs me to think about the um, generalized Slough's law. So I, I hope that a lot of you will be familiar with Slough's law. If it is not, then let's look at this photo. Uh, this is the Slough window, which is the, the uh, 180 degree of the world as seen by a fish that is under the water. It becomes about 100 degree, and outside this 100 degree, it becomes dark. So what happens? Um, this is because of the uh, refraction that when there's a wave that is incident from air into a material, the, the, um, the ray will bend, right, because it's different, different uh, um, permittivity, different index. Um, and there's a certain angle where it cannot go beyond inside the material, and this is called the critical angle. Now, what we want to do in our optimal thought, indeed, it is we want to reach the forbidden regions, that is, we want to reach beyond the critical angle. Now, this can be done currently by using immersion lens, but you don't want the patient to hold a 3D structure outside the body in order to bend the wave. Now, what we actually do with our optimal thoughts, it is it interact with the incident field. Um, when it interacting with it, uh, it makes it to be able to reach the forbidden region, that is, go beyond the critical angle. Now, now, you may ask why I would like to do that, why I would like to reach the crit uh, beyond the critical angles. Here, I would like to use time and frequency to explain this phenomenon. In time and frequency, when we have a signal that it is a very wide band, the signal in time domain will be very narrow, a very narrow pulse. Similarly, in here, if I can generate a signal that has a very wide angular spectrum, that is, if it can reach the forbidden region, forbidden angles, then it will have a very wide angular spectrum. Equivalently, there will be a very narrow spatial signal, and that's the reason why you see that there's a focusing effect in the optimal thought. We basically are doing some wavelength focusing to achieve a high power transfer efficiency. And in order to accomplish that, um, we are very lucky. You know, the structure actually is quite simple. It is made of some metal strips. Um, but each of them, it is uh, um, the wavelength spacing. Uh, for example, in, in this case, in this example, we use uh, the metal strips that within one wavelength, we place 20 metal strips. And each strips are noted by a different uh, passive element. By adjusting the elements, we are able to launch the wave that it is uh, uh, with the refracted angle, it is greater than the incident angle. It means that we already go beyond the critical angle. And we are able to reach the forbidden region that is beyond the critical angle consistently uh, with the different incident angles. And it also confirmed that without the material, without the tissue, no propagation, which is very similar to the, um, to the optimal solution that we showed before. And by superposition, we are able to generate um, the angular spectrum, the wave that is able to do some wavelength focusing, as you see in this slide, that we're able to accomplish one eighth of the lambda in the focusing into the material. And the structure that we're using, it is a ring structure with, and then uh, loaded by different uh, passive elements. And finally, 
um, we use these uh, devices. This is the, the structure that we're using. The dimension is about six centimeter, um, six, six centimeter in the width. And this is our transmitter and the battery. Now, we are holding these devices, which is quite, quite small, uh, to do a hard pacing for a tape. So in this case, we don't do open chest anymore, but instead we deliver the pacemaker uh, in, no, mini, with the minimally evasive procedures by drawing a hole in the thigh, in the thigh of the pig or in the leg of the pig, and then deliver the pacemaker using a catheter. And we put it inside the um, right atrium, the right ventricle, and also the left ventricle. Here it shows the X-ray images of the devices after, after implantation and also the location of our transmitter that put outside the, um, the chest, put on the, surf, on the skin of the, um, of the animal. Uh, what we want to demonstrate is this. We want to put the devices in the different locations of the heart and to do a more synchronized uh, pacing. So here you see that uh, when the device is on, it do the pacing in the different region and off then, the, the heart rate is lower, and when it's on, the heart rate it is um, faster, and there's a certain uh, lagging uh, delay, certain delay when the device is on, there's a certain delay before the heart rate increases. Um, the power for the left ventricle, the required transmit power, it is higher, about 200 milliwatt, because it is, the wall it is much thicker than those that it is in the right ventricle and the wage atrium. In the white atrium, the, with the transmit power, this is the transmit power from the transmitter outside. It's about 34 milliwatts. So here we demonstrate that with the pacemaker, with minimal evasive procedures, we are able to um, use our source, which is a very handy hand, handheld. We can even make it flexible, uh, uh, very easy to use source that to do the pacing. And this is the pacemaker that we put in the pit that compare with the uh, penny. Uh, a lot of time people thought that the silver part is the antenna. It is not the antenna. Silver part is just for fixation, for anchoring. Uh, the antenna, it is the red coil here, the two turns coil. And then that's the electronics that is putting inside. And the and one more electro, it is um, uh, inside the silver coil. This is the return electro, and then at the tip of this uh, super coil, it is another electro. And then all the other parts coded, uh, such that the two electrodes and the electronics um, put, uh, with the code are positive to code it. Um, so here, um, so far we just talked about pacemaker. But as I mentioned at the very beginning, I want to make electronics that are small enough such that it could put close to the nerves or the organ to do some therapeutic treatments. Um, pacemaker, it is not what I want to do, but it is a very good way to demonstrate the feasibility. Um, in order to move on um, to our original ideas of the bioelectronics medicine, uh, we want to do something that it is to, to show this idea. Um, in order to do that, I look at the neural pathways, um, the 12 um, uh, nerves that it is from the brainstem, and eventually I pick number 10, which is the vagus nerve. Uh, at the time when I returned to academia, I always heard people talk about vagus nerve. So I think this is a magic nerve. It can be useful in anything, seems to me. So if I pick this nurse, there may be something, you know, that will happen. And in particularly, uh, I focus on heart failure. So basically, I do vagus nerve stimulation in the right vagus nerve stimulation in the pig models for heart failure treatment. Um, in here, this is our transmitter. Now it becomes banded with the adhesive such that um, it could be just uh, stick it into the leg of the patient. Um, and then this is the receiver that is put on the vagus nerve. Um, and the transmitter and everything are integrated in this uh, cup electrode. And here it shows the X-ray images where we implanted the devices, and, sh and it shows the effect. Um, 
of the input power versus the heart rate and also the blood pressure. Okay, and it, here, it, so we say about, about 20 millivolt of input power from the source, from the source that is on the adhesive, we're able to change the heart rate by 20%. Similarly, with the input power of about 20 to 30 millivolt, we're able to change the blood pressure by about 20 to 30%. And here, this graph shows, you know, that we can consistently get it from in this process is reversible. That is, when we turn on the devices, the heart rate heart rate drops. When we turn it off, heart rate rises again, and turn it on, heart rate drops. Similarly for the blood pressure. And then here it shows the dynamic of it. When we have a pulse that it is 10 minutes on, 10 minutes off, you see that the heart rate it is pretty much for the um, the pattern of the on and off. For the blood pressure, um, it takes longer time to get to the initial stage. Therefore, the blood pressure is keep uh, decreasing. So if, if we increase the interval to be, you know, um, for example, half a, half a minute, we may be, you know, it may be able to show what we see for the heart rate. But anyway, this demonstrates the visibility that one application could be in hypertension. Instead of taking the drug to reduce the blood pressure, now you put a patch and then on the neck, and then by delivering the electrical pulses, it could reduce the pressure. So it cannot demonstrate the visibility of using electronics to replace drugs. In this case, we are targeting it is uh, the physiological state is the press, blood pressure. Um, going even further, um, so far we use the electronics it is to stimulate the nerve bundles. Uh, but it would be nice if we can um, stimulate the individual axon. And here it goes to the um, technology of uh, optogenetics. So using light, um, so so far what we, we're talking about is electrical stimulation. Electrical stimulation is lack of the uh, cell specificity, while optical stimulation using light, we're able to target to a particular neuron type. So that's the, that's the differences. Uh, and the current light delivery systems, um, this is the one that used in our collaborator's lab, Dysera's lab that there's the optical fiber, and then it delivers the light into the animal. And these two are the wireless versions. One, it is from Japan, another, it is from MIT. Um, it's very large headstand that is put in the, uh, um, on, the, on the animal. So imagine that you have the same volume and weight of your head that is put on top of your head. I don't think you will feel that this is freely behaving. And, but this is what happened to the animal experiments um, while they're trying to use the uh, wireless uh, light delivering system. Another, and with this kind of devices that it is uh, uh, for the MIT one, it is also wireless power. Therefore, you can see that there's a coil array here, the red one, many, many terms. Now, in order to increase the area where the animal can walk around, researchers, in my opinion, it is a little bit crazy. They put a magnetic sensor into the animal feet, and then they try to track the location of the animal. By after tracking where they are, they turn the coil that is underneath the animal. So basically, you could you could see that this is uh, the smallest cellular cell in a cellular network, and the customer, it is a single mouth. And then there will be long overlapping cells or overlapping cells. Whenever, imagine that whenever you go anywhere, this, they will locate where you are and then turn on that cell. And this is what happened to, um, to this uh, case. The, but instead of the human being, it is the animal. Um, there's another system that is developed by EPFL. Instead of having multiple cells and turn on the one that's close to the animal, they have the cells being moving with the animal and then track where the animal it is and keep powering it. Now, now I think this is uh, too much work and, and I 
when I encounter this problem that we need to increase the the propagation range of the uh, of the um, system such that the animal can be freely moving in a larger area. I feel this is crazy, and I want to be lazy. And in order to be lazy, we need to be a little bit more creative. So being inspired by quantum tunneling, uh, we develop a self-tracking system that doesn't require any electronics. So we can be lazy. Okay, let me play the video to illustrate how it works. A microwave cavity is a hollow metal structure. When it is excited by an RF source, it confines electromagnetic fields inside it. If we remove part of the metal structure, for example the top plate, energy from the source will radiate. But if we cover it with a metal plate patterned with sub-wavelength apertures, the honeycomb, energy from the source will confine within the hollow structure. There is no radiation. However, when a mouse is placed on the honeycomb, energy will be transferred to the mouse through the fringing evanescent field. This energy transfer follows the mouse over any path of motion on the honeycomb, achieving self-tracking without any tracking mechanisms. We make use of the properties that animal, uh, the tissue of the animal, basically we are made of 70% of water, right? The dielectric properties of water is about 80 times larger than the dielectric properties of air, permittivity. And we make use of differences in the permittivity to um, do the self-tracking as explained in the video. And in order to do that, then we need to study the retinal modes of a small animal. I think this is the most uh, ridiculous thing uh, I've ever done in my academic career. It is to study how a, an, a mouse resonates. And this involves the drawing of a very cute mouse in the electromagnetic, electromagnetic simulator, and then scale it small and large, and then with different orientation to figure out where what, what are the resonant modes are and such that we can design our cavity around that resonant uh, sequences. And uh, after we decide the cavity, which is where it can do self-tracking, the animal can run freely onto a larger area. Next, we need to build the implant. So here is just the devices that we build that to put in the right motor cortex of the, um, of the animal. Um, we follow the same implantation procedures as the one that they did uh, in uh, my collaborators did in the um, uh, for the optical fiber one. Therefore, we have to attach the optical fiber for holding. Afterwards, we we, we break the optical fiber and then do the suture. So at the end, you will see that the whole implantable devices it is it is fully inside the body. There's no nothing that it is uh, like the head that head stage. Uh, here you see the light coming out is because uh, when we write papers, we cannot say that the animal already has an implant inside. No one will believe you. So therefore, we have to increase the power a lot such that the light is lit out from the skull, such that you will see that the light. But in reality, it will be something like in this video that I want to show what happened. So we put the implant into the right motor cortex. Uh, you will expect that when the stimulation is on, the animal will move in counterclockwise. In the left, two um, has the tendency to move left, so it will move uh, counterclockwise in making circles. And as you can see, that the animal looks normal, right? You don't see an implant, but it's already there's an implant inside to control its brain. So you see that the circling behavior, the animal doesn't want to move in the counterclockwise direction, but it is forced to move. We're basically controlling the mouse. So here you see that this, uh, when the stimulation is off, it's random. When the stimulation is on, it do the circling effect. Uh, okay. So let me conclude this talk. Uh, we, we talk about you know electrical stimulation. We also talk about optical stimulation. And at the end, you know, we really hope that we can build the devices as small as the pill, and you will get this kind of devices in the countertop, in the drugstore, instead of the chemical one. And that concludes my talk.
Great. Thanks so much, Ada. So um, if you haven't submitted your questions, please do so as well. But Ada's going to choose some, some questions to go ahead and tackle now. Uh, so the first question is, how specialized would manufacturer be or could existing medical device manufacturers make this? Uh, I would like to say that uh, the technology that I just described will have been licensed to uh, two startups and also one uh, uh, big medical device companies. Um, they are translating them into something that it is um, useful. So therefore, I would say that uh, existing medical, medical device manufacturers could make it. And to my not to my best knowledge, that the focus of those startups are what I heard from the uh, technology office. It is one. It is for pain relief. Uh, another. It is for uranium incontinence. So is this FDA approved? Approved uh, air security. So I will let the two startups and the medical device companies to to show it <laughs> because they they pay money to get it right. They better show that uh, it could be FDA approved and pass the airport security. Um, what kind of health problem is this application focusing on? Uh, as I mentioned, right, the two companies that licensing our technology one focus on pain relief, another is uranium incontinence, but they may also work on other applications. Those are the applications that I heard from the technology office. Um, the longest that we, in, so we, the question is, will the device have any email response or is there any information when the device is inserted in the host? Now, so far we only do animal testing. The longest one that we did, it is uh, about one month and, and it seems fine. Um, when we uh, exploit the devices out and then it seems, and do the histology and it seems um, the surrounding tissue is not fine. So is it biodegradable, how stable devices in the body? As I just mentioned, right, we only do, we, the longest we did in animals is one month. And I will also let the two uh, startups and other companies, you know, they, they, saw, they, they work on the biocompatible problem. Are uh, these devices head proof and will it require a proof to Yeah, of course. It is not head proof. We need to, it is just a stimulator that with um, uh, wireless control. Um, it needs to have more functionalities like a processor uh, in order to do the encryption and decryption to make it to be a hacker free. Okay, based on the energy transfer in positive models, are changes to the process of device required for different body mass? This is a very good question. Now, before we do the animal testing, we kind of worry that uh, the, the structure will, will, will affect how the device performs. So we have a lot of backup solutions. But at the end, when we do the animal testing, we realize that um, they're pretty much the same. We don't need to adjust the device for the different animals. So I would say that um, it doesn't need to change because the variation it is not too much. Are you see this of being able to give continual feedback from neurological systems? Um, so the question is, do you see this as being able to give continual feedback from neurological systems? Um, this is the current problems we are solving. We're trying to incorporate both uh, our new recorder and the stimulators because we have a wireless transceiver already built in silicon. We're also um, collaborating with others to build the electrical recorders with um, a few hundred channels and stimulators um, to do the neurological applications. How do you remove these devices when the delivery or use is completed? Uh, this is a very good question. Usually after we finish the experiment, we just uh, um, kill the animal. We left, uh, remove it. Um, but of course, in order to do that, we need to really, you know, decide some special capital that is able to deliver it and at the same time it's able to unscrew it and remove it. What is the lifespan of these devices? Uh, it what is the lifespan of these devices? It depends on the coding. 
Um, for the one that we do accurate study, we just use regular apostis, so it doesn't last for a long time, maybe a few days. But for the one that we try to do the more chronic study, uh, we need to send it out to um, outside companies to do special coding such that it could last for much longer. Um, if taken in pill form, how will the device go to the location of the body where it is needed? So for the, the if you're looking at the devices, even though we put it in the pill form, there's some anchor, um, some anchor, several nicks that they try to anchor them into the tissue or into the nerve. Um, in, Implantation is always a challenge for uh, medical devices, and therefore it requires a lot of, it will be application specific. It is, it, the, the way to implant the devices, it will be really specialized to the type of applications that we are targeting at, so I cannot answer this, this question, you know. So it's, it's 11, and we want to be thoughtful of people's time. So maybe, Ada, you can pick two more questions to answer, and then we'll wrap it up for the day. Okay, can you explain the critical angle more? So critical angle, basically, when we have a ray that it is uh, emitting from air into water, for example, you will see that the ray, the, for example, if you shine the light uh, from outside the water to the water, inside the water, you will see that the light bends. And then it, it is bent towards the center. And there's a certain critical angle where the light will not pass it when it is inside the water. And this is the critical angle. And that's called the slouch window, as I show in the photo. That's the reason why the 180 degree of the world, that, uh, it becomes only about 100 degree from the fish that is inside the body, inside the water. It's because of this critical angle effect. Do you have any plans to extend research into studying these applications to a wireless body area network? Uh, actually, I, I, I don't really buy the idea of wireless body area network, so um, no. <laughs> Great. Okay, so we are going to wrap it up. Um, I want to say a big, big thank you um, to Ada for a wonderful presentation. Your research and what you do is so exciting and for taking time to answer attendee questions as well. And we want to thank you for taking the time to attend today and we'll see you at our next webinar. Thanks so much and have a great day. Thank you.